This was billed as an advanced seminar, which means there are some concepts I think you all sort of have already. But what I want to review is, even though you might have the gist of clicker training, how do people slow themselves down when they use it? So that maybe you've been using clicker training, but you're not finding that the results are all that you'd want them to be. And what are some of the common ways that people slow themselves down? Speed bumps. So the reason I'm calling these things speed bumps is exactly analogous to when you're driving, you can drive over a speed bump, but it means you have to slow down. So you can be clicker training and not getting speed and momentum and picking up your efficiency if you're having some of these speed bumps crop up in your training. These should be familiar to you. This is a review. You guys are advanced. So we're going to go through them quick. Number one speed bump I see every single time I watch clicker trainers train is this one. It's huge. It seems like nitpicking. It's so not nitpicking that students, pet dog owners come to me, their first class, this is the very first concept I deal with with pet owners. Okay? So blocking the click sound with any other salient stimuli. At the instant that you click your clicker or use whatever marker signal you're using, for argument let's say clicker, you should communicate no other information to the dog at that instant. Nothing. It's the sprint commercial where the pin drops and you hear the pin dropping because it's so quiet. I don't mean just acoustically quiet. There is no stimulus being communicated to the dog other than the click. That's the analogy that's often used of a staircase, meaning that you would have a behavior that the dog is doing in its repertoire already. You look at the dog and you say, in the course of this dog's behavior, the dog does occasionally turn its head to the right. So you might say, right head turn is the step that you're starting on. It's what the dog's already doing. It's the behavior you've got. But that's not what you want. You want a fast, tight spin. That's what you're looking for. And you've watched your dog for a few weeks and that just doesn't happen on its own. You can't capture the behavior. I'll just wait till it happens and I'll click it when it does. Nah, cows are going to come home before that happens. So you say, I really want that tight, fast spin. I'm going to shape it. You're going to start on a step with some behavior the dog already is offering you. When you're designing a shaping plan, I often want you to think of how would you get to the top of the stairs? Meaning, if this is the spin, fast, tight, spin, how would you design the stairs in between to get from what you've got to what you want? So one error is going to be your steps are really big and steep and the dog literally can't make it up and in fact looks at that staircase and goes, forget it, and leaves, right? It's two biggest steps. You not only don't get them walking up, but you get no momentum. You've made them very steep. Your steps in this um, shaping plan are too big. They don't look big to you because you've got the goal in mind. The dog doesn't have the goal in mind. They don't know where you're going. They don't have the end answer. They're simply going like a car driving with its headlights in the fog. They can only see as far as the headlights go. They're only on the step. They don't know anything beyond that. So you say, wow, this isn't much I'm asking you. It's just this little bit toward this big goal. Well, the dog doesn't get it. It only knows where it's at right at that moment. Behavior chains. In the No Way, No How seminar, that preliminary three-day intensive clicker training seminar that is the precursor to this, we do a segment of having everybody teach their dogs at least a two-behavior chain. Rather than take time to repeat that exercise, I really want to go through for you. If we could take the whole half hour coaching someone up here to do the demo. I'm not sure that's our best use of time. I think it makes sense to verbally go through what really should be reviewed for many of you on some of the problems um, and hints for training a chain. Most complex behaviors we teach are service dogs, search and rescue dogs, agility dogs, competition obedience dogs. Most of the things we consider advanced behavior are 
chains. So on your handout, so the only handout for this little segment is, I think it says chains, I think. Does it say <laughs> Okay. What a creative title. Um, yeah, okay. So it starts off with what is a behavior chain. So what we have are behaviors that follow each other without a time gap. There is no pause. They're governed by cues from the trainer or from the environment. We usually call those prop cues if they're from the environment. The primary reinforcer occurs at the end of the chain. And the point I really want to bring home in this half hour is cues are the glue that holds the chain together. It's cues, what we just talked about in our last lecture, that are the thing I think people um, don't use very consciously when they're creating a chain. If T is okay, what I'm going to do is suck up to the dog, which is always the initial. Can she have anything that's in my bag? Anything. And so now what I'd like to do is click her for different behaviors. Missed a look at me. I'm actually getting a spin, so I need to stop that. So I'm getting a clockwise spin. There's the clockwise spin. Touch, late click. Stopping ahead, turn toward you. Oh, sorry, Hal. Little cough. Oh, I don't mean to throw them that far, sorry. Walking toward the fan. Lovely. 